thank God for his word. So um, during this Easter season, although today is Palm Sunday, I'm not preaching a Palm Sunday specific word. But for the next three today and the next two Sundays, I'm going to be teaching an Easter series. We're going to be focusing on Jesus' final words on the cross. Jesus' final words on the cross. That is our Easter series uh, this year. It is often said that the final words of a person are to be taken very seriously. The final words of someone who is moving on from this earth are to be taken very seriously. Whenever time is running out on someone, and uh, you know, they often would call their loved ones, the, most, the closest people to them, they will call them together to their bedside. And then it, it's considered serious business. You know, whatever you do, that is when you turn off your phone, you, you, you turn off you know, every distraction it's because you want to listen. It is a, a moment of truth to not, not to be taken lightly. It is during those moments that very, very deep-seated things are revealed. Things that they may never have talked about before ever in their lives, that's when they talk about those things because they know that and everyone around knows that there will not be or there may not be another opportunity to do what needs to be done. Amen. In the case of Jesus Christ, we all know that he rose up again after dying, he rose up again. And he said many more things after he rose up. So that was not his very, very last opportunity, amen? But that was the end of a phase. That was the end of a very important phase that he stayed on earth, his ministry and everything. So the words that he spoke on the cross are still as significant as the last statements of anyone who is passing on. And you know that the words of Jesus are critical. Even all the words that he spoke through throughout his ministry, they are the words that have sustained you and I up until now. If it were not for words, the earth wouldn't be made, amen. Our earth wouldn't exist. The heaven would not exist because they were all created with words. And Jesus Christ was the word of God that existed from the beginning, let alone his final words. So I just want to call you to attention today that we need to take Jesus' final words in particular very, very seriously. Now, in total, we, and we know that there are seven statements, seven statements that are recorded in the Bible as Jesus' last words, seven statements, the last words on the cross. And we can find them in all the Gospels. We find uh, one of them in Matthew and Mark. It occurs, it, it, it's recorded both in Matthew and Mark. And then we find three of them in the Gospel of Luke. And we find the other three in the Gospel of John. Do we have some good Bible students there? One in Mar Matthew and Mark, three in Luke, and three in John. And so we're going to get started today. We're going to look through these Gospels to see what did our master say, what legacy, what important nuggets did he leave for us when he was moving on. Amen. The very first of Jesus' final words on the cross is, and, and just so you know, I'm not listing this in any chronological order. The scriptures are not very clear which one he said first and which one he said next and that order. So I am arranging them in the order that makes you know, sense to me as I studied them. So the very first one I want to talk about is, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And I want us to quickly go to Luke. 
Luke chapter 23, and I would like us to read a number of verses just to put things in context. So Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 37. 32 to 37, the gospel of Luke 23. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right, right hand, and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the, the, the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself, amen. Oh my, that was the very first thing I want us to look at today. Now, Jesus was very, very aware, amen. Jesus was very aware that the person, you know, he knew, he knew the person who was going to betray him. He knew the people who, you, the people who arrested him, the one who betrayed him, the one who arrested him, the group that came to arrest him, those who passed a judgment against him, those who molested him, amen, those who ridiculed him, and those who finally crucified him, all these groups of people, Jesus knew very well that they did not fully understand what they were doing. They did not. In fact, if they did, they wouldn't have done what they did. Amen. They, they did not have a full appreciation or, or the, the, of the scope of their behaviors. Sometimes some people can be overly passionate. Please listen to me, and this may speak to your life or somebody that you know, that Sometimes we can be very, very passionate about things that we have no idea about. We think we understand, but we don't fully understand. We think we know, but you know what? We are far from grasping the full import of our actions because we are very, man is finite. Man is limited when we compare humans to God, we are like a drop in the ocean. Amen. Isaiah um, 55, 9 says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Man, I mean, scientists have been traveling, astronauts have been traveling to space, to the moon, to other planets for so long, but they have never been able to get to the heavens. Amen. They've never been able to get there. So God says, as far as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways your, higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So, beloved, just when we feel we understand, we have no idea. So, although we, we did not kill Jesus, you and I listening to me did not kill Jesus, is it possible that we are engaged in things that have, we have no idea about? Is it possible that we are passionately, zealously engaged in some things that we have no idea what we are doing? We think we have full understanding, but we do not. And the question for, for, to us today is, do you know what you are doing? That's my question for us. 
He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you know, child of God, do you know what you're doing? When, when Adam and Eve were eating the forbidden fruit, did they understand what they were doing? Amen. Do you really understand? In fact, there's a very funny, um, funny uh, um, you know, joke that is going around today in social media. It says, you know, uh, somebody said, I can't understand. I can't, I, I just don't know how we came to inherit <laughs> Adam and Eve's sin, but then we don't inherit Solomon's wealth. It beats my understanding. Amen. But do we really understand when, if Eve were to know, she would not have eaten that fruit, isn't it? That's why we should never think that we have full knowledge. That's why we should always rely on God. Amen. God is that receptacle that we rest on. Um, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The, the only thing that can redeem us is God's forgiveness. That is our only way out of the ignorance that we find ourselves in. That's why we ask God for forgiveness at every opportunity. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. We humans need to ask for forgiveness at every opportunity that we get. I like how somebody puts forgiveness. Somebody describes forgiveness as follows, confession and forgiveness. She said, you know, confessing and asking for forgiveness are just like taking a spiritual bath. Most, most people, I believe, I believe our church family, amen, we take baths daily or showers daily. So it is appropriate for us to also take spiritual baths as often as we can. That is, that is forgiveness, I mean, confession and forgiveness. Confession and forgiveness. We can never overdo these two things. So similarly, we, we're going to be, if we want to be like Jesus, right? If we want to be like Jesus, we also need to cultivate that heart of mercy, the heart of compassion, the habit of forgiving others on the basis that they think they know what they are doing against us, but they might not know after all. Amen. They might not know after all. They might not have a full appreciation of the repercussions, the full implications of their actions. So the next time somebody offends you, we want to remember that maybe they don't fully understand what they are doing. Amen. Somebody said, I receive it. Amen. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but, you know, did you notice that Jesus did not wait? He did not wait until the pain was over before he forgave. He forgave while he was still in pain, gasping for air. That was when he forgave. I believe that is because if you want to wait until the pain is over, until your heart cools down before you forgive, you may never have the opportunity. And I pray for you and I pray for me. You know, sometimes time runs out on us and we are never able. That's what Jesus said. If you are coming to give me an offering and you are on the way to the altar and you remember that you have something against a brother or sister, go and make amends before you come and give. Amen. We want to learn from Jesus. We want to forgive in the moment, in the heat of the moment. And I pray that God will grant us grace. So that was Jesus' first statement, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, the second statement I would like us to bring up today, and we are going to continue this series, so I'm not too much in a hurry. Wherever we get to when time is up, 
we will leave it there and we'll come back to continue. The second statement that Jesus said was what? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that is the old King James. We will read the new King James. Let's go to Luke chapter 23, the same chapter we just read. And let's look at verses um, 39 to 43. Verses 39 to 43 from the New King James Version of the Bible. Luke 23. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly for, you know, we and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward for of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, come on. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And in verse 43, Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Assuredly, I say to you, today, in, in Africa, in Ghana, we will say, today, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Amen. In this statement, we hear our Lord Jesus Christ granting a condemned criminal. Human beings have condemned him, them, the two of them, okay? But human beings condemn them that they deserve to die. But Jesus granted this condemned criminal eternal life, not at just any time, but at the point of his death, just before he died. And very often we think that, you know, we, we human, we think that either we ourselves, okay, or, or maybe other people have committed too many sins. I don't know if you've ever felt like that before. You feel like you have done too many wrong things in your life to deserve God's forgiveness. And you, you, but you forget, amen. We forget that no amount of sin is too much for the blood of Jesus to cleanse. No amount of sin is too much for Jesus' blood to cleanse. Look, this man was condemned. He sins. Maybe he was an armed robber. Maybe he was a murderer. Maybe he did some heinous, he committed some heinous crimes. And he truly, according to the law, deserved to die. But here is Jesus turning the tables. I pray that somebody's tables are being turned right now. That is, that is what Jesus does. That is what our Lord does. That is his specialty. He turns the tables in our favor. You know, when men have given their judgment, he, of, he and, and, and does, is that a word? Amen. He comes around and to undo the judgment that men have pronounced over us. I believe that, if, you know, if Jesus were like some Christians that I know today, amen, he would have asked for the man's resume first. You ask for his track record. Which family do you come from? Amen. How long have you been born again? What have you been doing in the church? Amen. He would have raised the heaven entry requirements so high that the criminal on the cross would not even dream. He would not have the slightest chance of entering heaven. Isn't that what we think we, some of us do, right? We have become more Catholic than the Pope. Amen. 
Heaven entry requirements, yes, that's what it is. He, we would have raised the bar so high that, huh, I mean, uh, even, even the bishop will find it hard to enter into heaven. And, and by heaven, I'm also referring to, figuratively, I'm referring to the, all the good things that you have to offer in life. Your home, your property, your time, that you value so much, right? Do people have to meet some very strict requirements before they have access to your heaven? I'm asking you a question. Yes, don't, don't look left or right, amen. Do people have to meet some requirements before they have access to you? Now, next time you think about heaven, think about the blessings of God in your life the things that you have to offer. Do you offer it freely? Or do you, you know, measure it for people based on whether they qualify or not? And in the first place, no one ever deserves God's forgiveness. No one. And it doesn't matter how righteous we have lived our lives, righteously we've lived our, our lives on earth, no one ever deserves or qualifies for heaven unless it is granted by God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says what? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is only by grace. And you remember that scripture that says, freely you have received, freely give. Come on, is a, a child of God listening to me? If these things, you know, salvation, redemption, righteousness, eternal life, if they were granted to us freely, why should we measure it for others? And in this interaction, we see that, you know, people don't have to be believers for a very long time, for many years, in order to receive eternal life. I believe some of the questions that you are going to be asked when you go out witnessing, we are answering them right here. Amen. We are answering those questions right now. You don't have to be a believer for many years in order to qualify for heaven. And you will never qualify anyways. It is given. Eternal life has nothing to do with how long you've been a Christian. The only thing that is needed is a true heart conviction and an expression of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just express your faith. When you see people on the streets, you see people at work, you see people in the community, stop them. You say, do you believe in Jesus? You know, do you believe in Jesus Christ as the son of God? God wants to make you his child. All that he needs you to do is believe in his son, Jesus. Amen. And the Holy Spirit himself accomplishes a transformational work on the inside. And that work happens right away, instantly and completely. The transformation happens instantly. It happens completely. And the person has a new destiny and a new, you know, place and, and a new destiny, a new destiny in their lives. All that the saved criminal said was, don't you fear God? That means that he believed in God. That means that he had the fear of the Lord in his life, in his heart. At least he gained the fear of the Lord at the last minute. He gained the fear of the Lord at the last. Then he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That means that this guy actually believed in Jesus Christ as, the, as a king. And he had that fear of the Lord. Maybe when he saw the, the way that Jesus was treated and the kind of words that he was saying, maybe when he saw that Jesus said he heard that Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. At that point, 
That was all he needed to hear. He did not need to hear a long sermon. That was enough to convince him that this is the son of God. Amen. Maybe one thing that you will say to somebody would convince them to accept Jesus Christ. You don't need a whole sermon. You don't need the, to read a whole chapter of the Bible. I pray for you that God will strengthen us. God will fortify our words. So one sentence, one remark can win people. One remark that we make can win people to the Lord. Amen. And when men have written you off, Jesus is about to open a new chapter for you. A glorious chapter that will blow the minds of people. And one man of God said, it is not over until God says it is over. Amen. It doesn't matter how late someone comes to the kingdom of God. God has his arms open. And finally, I mean, just want to make one more statement before we move on. In that single interaction between Jesus and, um, and the criminals, we see another criminal who came very, very close to Jesus Christ. He was next door to Christ, right next to him, very, very close. But although he interacted with the son of the living God, he ended up in hell. And I pray in the name of Jesus that those of us who came to taste of the Lord, that those of us who came close, he came to church. Let's say that the second criminal came to church, but then he ended up in hell. Amen. You know, all that he came to do in church was that he came to criticize. If you are truly the son of God, why not save yourself and save us also? Right? There are some people who come to church, but they come with a different agenda. All they come to do is to criticize. All they come to do is to pass judgment. All they come to do is to see who is, you know, who is who, who is wearing what. If you came with that agenda, beloved, you will miss the mark. And I pray that God will shift our focus on him and him alone and put the fear of God in us. So we can come truly, you know, as the other criminal who opened up and received forgiveness. Amen. I pray in the name of Jesus that it will not be you missing the mark, but God will keep us on the straight and narrow, then straight and narrow. Let's look at the third thing that Jesus said, and then we will round up for today. The third um, statement that Jesus made on the cross was, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. Behold your son, behold your mother. And this can be found in the book of John, chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. So let me um, just read that. It's in verse 26, but I'm just reading 26 and 27. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. John 19, 26, 27, New King James Version says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Amen. So over here, we are seeing Jesus still in pain, gasping for air, you know, in the most difficult, most, you know, challenging times of his life. But even in these moments, he is demonstrating compassion, mercy, grace, right? By ensuring that 
His mother would be taken care of in his absence. How many of us can lay aside our pain to ensure another person's comfort? Didn't he have his own problems to focus on? Yes, of course. Didn't he have brothers, other brothers, who could have taken care of his mother? Yes, he did. But he was not about to be self-centered. Even at the very end, he was as selfless as he, the first time he came on earth. He lived a, a 100% selfless life for the sake of others, for the comfort of others, for the salvation of others, for the benefit of others. At one time, he saw the crowds and the scripture said he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. It is this compassionate Lord and master that we serve, amen. This time he saw his mother and he had compassion on her, knowing that she would need help after he was gone. She would need help after he, he laid the earth. And one of the things that you will notice is that John, I mean, very, very interesting fact here. John was so humble that he didn't even mention his own name. It was John who was standing there. And this scripture is recorded in John, <laughs> in the Gospel of John. So while he was writing the account, he decided not to mention his name as the disciple that was standing by. He said the disciple that Jesus loved. Amen. He, he, he just, one of the most striking revelations is that John, you know, he wanted to stand by the side. He didn't want to, he didn't want to mess up with the story. He, he didn't want to stand in the way of what his Lord was doing. And then the other thing that I learned about John over here, the last thing we learned about John over here is that John took Jesus's instruction as law. He took it as an immediate and final instruction without question. He did as the Lord commanded without questioning, without argument, without hesitation. And I pray that God will grant us, God will grant you and me, the heart of um, absolute and instant obedience. Because the scripture said, as soon as Jesus gave the instruction, that disciple took Jesus' mother straight to his own home, no questions asked. Master has spoken, final, amen. I pray that you will come to that place that once Jesus has spoken, once God has spoken, once the Bible has recorded it, it is final, it is instant, there is no argument about it. There are some things that, you know, we spoke about so many times in the word of God, but we are not seeing results. One of the things that I'm still waiting to see results about is our tithing, our giving, our first fruits and all of that. We speak about them. The only thing I haven't done is that I have not taught, I've not preached a whole series on first fruits. I have not dedicated a whole month to preach about first fruit. So that's something I will need to do in the future. But we've preached about this, we've talked about them, and we still are not seeing the evidence, the manifestation, the results. And I'm asking myself, are we hearing the words? Are we hearing the words? As soon as John heard Jesus spoke, speak, he took it as final, no questions asked. I pray that this words that we, the Lord has, you know, spoken to us today, that these words have found their way into the core of our hearts. Amen. I pray that they will find a good place 
to sprout, to germinate, to yield fruits in your life. And I would like you to begin to pray. We spoke about three things that Jesus said while he was on the cross. One of them is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The other one is, verily, verily, I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. And the third thing that Jesus said was, woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Amen. Let's begin to pray. Let's pray, say, Lord, let your word find a treasured place in my heart. May your word abide in me. And may your word make a change, a change in my makeup, in my spiritual makeup, in my genetic makeup, in my emotional makeup. Let your word translate me into something different, a different person. And Lord, I pray for everyone who does not have you as their Lord and master right now, that Lord, they will come to the saving knowledge of you. And so if you are listening to me right now and you don't know if Jesus is your Lord and master, can we pray a simple prayer? If you believe in Jesus Christ and you want him to be your Lord and your master, please pray this with me, after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for dying for my sins. I believe you are the son of God. I believe that you came to die for me. I open my heart today and I ask you to come into my life. Please become my Lord and my master. And please forgive me of my past life, my past actions, my past ignorance, and my past sins. Cleanse me and make me a brand new person so I can spend eternity with you in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for an answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 